Hello and welcome to the America's Table, hosted by the Georgetown America's Institute. I'm Mooney Jensen, here to talk to leaders of the region who have transformed their vision into reality. Today's turn at the table is from Michael Shifter. Michael is a leading voice in Latin America, leading a regional think tank and a rare forum for open and respectful exchange of ideas in the Americas. He's an adjunct professor here at Georgetown and has served in multiple boards and is a balanced and credible voice on hemispheric affairs, widely quoted in top media and journals everywhere. Michael has announced that he will be retiring from the dialogue in the coming months. It's a difficult news for us, but we're happy to sit him down at the table and make sure that we talk to him and hear his views on elections, on immigration, on economic recovery, and of course, on leadership. Welcome to the America's Table, Michael. Thank you, Mooney. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you, and we have so much to talk about. It's a very busy voting season in Latin America. There was recent uh, pseudo-elections in Venezuela and Nicaragua. There are surprising results uh, upcoming in Chile and Peru, and some very uncertain outcomes in the, up, in the 2022 elections in Colombia. Can you give us your impressions of the electoral cycle? Mm -hmm. Well, you're right. We have a very uh, super cycle now. We're in the super cycle. Uh, there were no surprises in Venezuela and Nicaragua. We knew what was going to happen uh, because there was not, uh, not, not conditions that meet minimal standards for elections, to call them elections. Uh, but we've seen a lot of surprises. And I think what this shows is that traditional political parties, especially of the center, more moderate uh, parties, uh, are very weak. Uh, some of them are collapsing. And so you have the emergence of uh, outsiders in, in Peru, uh, Pedro Castillo. And in Chile, most dramatically, uh, you could argue that the four top vote getters in the first round of the Chilean elections uh, were outsiders, uh, uh, Boric and Cast, but also Parise, uh, and even Sichol, who considers himself an independent. So this in a country where you had center-right and center-left coalitions that were very uh, stable, coherent, uh, well-structured, uh, and haven't done well. So this means that there's a new era, there are new political forces, new political faces, and uh, a high level of fragmentation, and in many cases, polarization. And people are voting for the lesser of two evils. In Peru, they did that. Chile, they did that to some extent. In Honduras, I think they did that as well. And all of them are going to inherit a very difficult economic situation. The whole continent had been living a period of prosperity, which kind of came to a halt before COVID. And after COVID is the region in the world that has been most hard hit by the pandemic. What type of recovery can we expect for Latin America? And what are some of the tools that these new leaders and the existing ones use for a sustainable recovery? Well, I think it's going to be very, very difficult uh, to govern in these circumstances because, as you say, the economic conditions uh, are very, very bad in most of the countries. Um, there have been severe setback, setbacks in lots of areas because that were there before the pandemic and only got worse because of the pandemic. And it's going to be very, very hard to, to recover. And I think uh, what you need is to go back to basics and fundamentals um, and trying to focus more on uh, education, on strengthening competitiveness, um, on trade opportunities where they, where they exist, uh, infrastructure. There's a lots of areas that need a lot of attention. And there, in order to satisfy social demands and pressures on these governments, you're going to need, uh, governments are gonna to have to have more effective education systems, health systems, uh, pension reform, things like that, and tax reform. So there are lots of tools in the policy uh, toolkit, but the problem is that it's hard to govern in situations where they're polarized, where there's a lot of mistrust uh, between different political forces. So um, there's an opportunity there, but it's gonna be very, very difficult in almost all of the cases. It's sometimes hard to simplify Latin America and kind of use a, a big bucket to describe it. But now there's been talk about how Latin America is once again turning to the left. 
Do you find this simplistic? Because there are leaders like Bukele, like Bolsonaro, like uh, candidates in Chile and Colombia and other countries that are absolutely not from the left and they're still um, gaining some ground. Is this more of a democratic retreat or is this really a pivot to um, a leftist ideology? Well, I, I've never been, uh, even, even when they talked about the pink tide, I was always um, sure there's ideological component to this back then and there is today. Um, but more, it, what more than ideological it is, uh, what you're seeing is populism, um, a challenge to the establishment, to traditional elite groups, because people are very, very unhappy. We know that from all the polling. Um, and there's dissatisfaction with the performance of democratic systems. And so people are looking for alternatives uh, to that. And so that's fertile ground for populist leaders who rail against the old elites and make big promises. Um, and people are very attracted to that. So I think that's more the pattern. In some cases, those populists have become authoritarian when there aren't strong institutional structures in, in many of the countries. But I think that's more of, of the trend that we're seeing is just the backsliding of democracy because populist leaders appeal directly to the people, they believe they embody the general will uh, of all the population. And, um, and I think they're gaining ground. And I think, unfortunately, the condi as conditions get worse, I think it's more likely that we're going to see the emergence of those kinds of leaders. Is there not a little bit of fatigue with these outsiders? Because we see Lula kind of raise, rising from the ashes. We see politicians like Petro, who's been around for a long time, and Keiko at the um, Peruvian election, who's also been around for a while and is certainly not an outsider. I think there are there is fatigue, but there's also a scarcity of options. Um, you know, pe elections are about choosing between different people. And I think most Brazilians would probably prefer to have other candidates than Bolsonaro and Lula. Um, the Colombians would like to see strong candidates who is not not Petro. Um, I think the I think the Chileans would have liked to see another candidate besides Boric and, and, and Cast. I think the Peruvians would have liked to see the other another candidate. But the problem is those options are not getting much traction, uh, unfortunately, uh, because I think being centrist, being moderate, is not doesn't sell politically. I think people are in very very desperate kind of conditions, and so populism of the right or populism of the left, whatever ideological tendency, uh, I think is much more uh, likely to emerge in these conditions. What do you think is the role of the private sector in this economic growth that is definitely needed in Latin America? It seems like the private sector is doing okay. There are, there's a lot of growth, uh, new infrastructure projects, pri private investment, etc. But they don't really play a an important role in society as kind of constructing bridges between voters and politics and institutions. Are they too quiet or too complacent? I, I think that there one has to also break down, you know, business, you know, the private sector. Some in the private sector, I think, are very uh, far-sighted and have a vision and know that they need to be part of the solution, which is addressing inequalities. Um, and social demands and responding more effectively and doing their part because they know that if these societies are not sustainable um, and governance is not really viable in, unless you uh, correct some of those, uh, those big gaps in society. So I think uh, I applaud those, those, uh, those private sector groups that are doing that. I think others are not as far-sighted and have playing a more traditional role and think that you know doing well for the corporation and making money and investments and so forth is enough. Um, hopefully, that other private sector that has a more of a vision uh, about really looking in the long term uh, will gain ground because I think otherwise uh, these societies are not going to be sustainable. There are just too many social demands. There are new actors. There's the young people that are very mobilized, that are aware, that are socially connected to the rest of the world. And simply, there has to be uh, a response that comes from authorities, whether they're of the private sector or also uh, the government as well. Let's talk about climate change. After the COP26 summit, 
um, there was a lot of uh, talk about how the, the climate agenda poses opportunities for emerging markets, especially in Latin America, but it also poses significant risks. What, do you, how, what is your assessment of this kind of risk opportunity balance? Well, I think, I think Latin America does have enormous opportunities in renewable energy, and I think that you know, the energy transition is possible. The problem is uh, that we have a number of governments that, especially of the big countries, uh, signaling out you know, Mexico and Brazil, uh, which are still very much reliant on, on fossil fuels. And so, um, and there's still a lot of gain in the short term um, to invest in those, in those more traditional energy sectors. And so, um, you know, I, I, I think Latin America is lagging behind in that, in that regard, in terms of really embracing the climate change agenda. Um, there are some examples, I think Colombia is one, where I think there's some positive developments, encouraging developments in terms of protecting biodiversity and the like. But I mean, the biggest uh, example of the problem is the Amazon, uh, obviously, and the destruction, deforestation of the Amazon, which is really a terrible uh, tragedy. And yet, you know, uh, really, I think Latin America really needs to do a lot more. I think they probably eventually will. Uh, because they have to. Um, this transition is inevitable. This is the way it's going. Um, but I think it's not, it's not really, uh, really doing so with a lot of uh, enthusiasm or commitment at this point. So when I first met you, Michael, uh, the world was very excited about integration of the Americas. That was a very long time ago. <laughs> Um, and it seems that that interest has waned. But then recently, there's been some type of uh, rumblings of integration in some of the countries in Latin America that are not necessarily political. They're more trade and, and growth um, oriented. Do you have any hope for integration in the Americas now, many years later? I think this has one of the most, been one of the most disappointing uh, areas, frankly, um, in the region. As you know very well, Latin America trade within the region is very, very low. Uh, it needs to be much stronger. It needs, needs to be much higher. Uh, it's not to say there aren't examples that are, uh, I think, are encouraging. Uh, certainly the Pacific Alliance, I think, did achieve a lot at the beginning when it first emerged, but it also has kind of stagnated at this point. Mercosur certainly hasn't, you know, hasn't been very successful by any measure. And so there have been attempts, but they really haven't succeeded. And I think there is a connection between the political polarization and the political fragmentation and the viability of those integration schemes. I think they're, it's very hard to sustain them uh, in, the, in, a, in, a political, in a very difficult political context, an economic context that we're seeing. Uh, but I think one has to identify those areas and at least they give some hope that integration uh, you know, does, uh, does have some possibilities. Uh, and I think it does, but I think overall of my assessment, it's been pretty disappointing. That's true. So let's pivot a little bit and talk about you for a bit. How does a guy from New Jersey end up being one of the leading voices on Latin America in Washington and around the region? Well, I, you know, I, I'm not sure about, I agree with the characterization, but um, I, it, it's very generous of you. But I, you know, I, from a very early, you know, age, at 14, I went to Mexico as an exchange student and lived with a fam family and learned Spanish and just had always been drawn and gravitated to Latin culture, Latin society. And then spending a year in, in your country, in Colombia, was a real turning point for me. Uh, you know, I was 21 and, and studied at the university, studied political science and international relations. It was a very, very agitated moment, a very interesting politi politically, uh, stimulating, fascinating. And uh, Colombia, as you know better than I do, uh, just offers a, a lot of what's going on, lots of contradictions. And I was also exposed to lots of social injustice as well, inequality. And so that really changed my awareness and consciousness. And from there, um, you know, I continued to be uh, working on it as an undergraduate and then graduate school. And then eventually the path, uh, first in working in foundations, in different foundations, uh, and then eventually uh, the think tank, the Inter-American Dialogue. But I've, I've never um, you know, lost interest in Latin America because it's so surprising and so fascinating. And um, there, you know, you just, and so it really, I think, really uh, engages and has engaged uh, my interest. In, in addition, I love Latin Americans. Uh, and so that's nice to be able to work uh, in an area where you love the people and get along with the people and feel some sort of connection to them. And so 
Um, it's just, uh, I think, was unexpected. I think my parents have, were were puzzled by it uh, for a while, but um, they were surprised. They, they were surprised, and I think that's what they had in mind, or that was one of the options. But um, but I think it's been it's been a great ride, and I've learned a lot, and I've uh, had the great privilege of having met just a number of just remarkable people in Latin America. Tell us about some of the events that have kind of struck you or surprised you in a, re in a region that surprises a lot. What are some of the memories you have over the past decades of things that are just really kind of in, stuck in your head? Well, I, I certainly, um, I was only in Cuba once, and I was in Cuba in December of 2014. Um, and I went to a conference on U.S.-Cuban relations in which all of the experts there uh, didn't predict that there'd be any change. And the next day, uh, I woke up and I had a meeting with the ambassador of the European Union, and he said, did you hear the news? And I said, what? And he said that you know, Barack Obama and Raul Castro are coming on at noon and will announce the resumption of bilateral relations. So much for all the analysts. So much for all the analysts. Uh, and a great credit to the Obama administration for managing that in a very uh, professional and discreet way. But I was totally surprised. I was totally surprised. I, I, you know, have to admit, and I think um, uh, after her, after hearing from all the specialists, both Cuban and North American from the United States, um, saying that you know you might see a few things here and there, but nobody uh, thought that that was uh, going to happen. So I was very surprised. Uh, I wrote an article for Politico, uh, kind of a letter from Havana, and said while there was a, a you know a warm reception and, and, and reaction to that. Um, I think a lot of Cubans were also skeptical that their government would do very much to, to change things, um, and that's turned out to be right. So uh, I tried to talk to a lot of Cubans about how they felt, but that was a very, you know, certainly a very interesting part of history. Very, in the part of history, yeah, and, and it happened to be the only, only time I've been to, to Cuba. You and I were at the Ivan Duque inauguration in 26, 2018, and and for some reason there was a hurricane in Bogota. Very rare, but it was gusty winds and a downpour um, and certainly an interesting transition. What other inaugurations do you remember kind of? As well, I remember yeah, that one I won't forget. Um, <laughs> we were soaked. Uh, we were soaked. Uh, we stayed till the end. Uh, not everybody stayed till the end, but I stayed till the very end. And uh, uh, President, President Duque, you know, gave his speech and, and, and I was there and, and listened with great attention. Uh, I also remember Juan Manuel Santos's inauguration before, which was also very, very, I remember very rainy and windy. Uh, so the two Colombian inaugurations, I went, everybody had umbrellas in hand, and we had umbrellas for both the Duque and the Juan Manuel Santos inauguration. So it's my association with some of the Colombian uh, inaugurations. I certainly won't forget uh, inauguration of Alejandro Toledo in Peru when uh, Hugo Chavez was there. I was in the same hotel where he was staying, and I got to see him up close in the way he acted and the way he dealt with people and so forth. And he was obviously somebody who was a leader of the left at that point. That was extremely interesting to, to be there with him. And then I remember the two Mexican uh, inaugurations, one of Vicente Fox, which was very exciting because it was really the first time you had a, it was really democracy, you had a, a party that was not, uh, not of the pre. Uh, you know, that was taking office, and that was the break from 70-year from right. rule of PRI. That was interesting. And then I went to Lopez Obrador's inauguration, which was fascinating, uh, talking about very symbolic, very historic, very different, very different from, from Fox, uh, talking about the, the fourth transformation and all the like. Uh, and I found that extremely interesting. I also really remember uh, Michelle Bachelet's inauguration, which was also extremely interesting in, in Chile. So one of the characteristics of the dialogue, and I think it's kind of your brand personally as well, is talking to people from all walks of life, from every ideology, and that's created some very interesting events at the dialogue, which have, you know, have protesters and, and a lot of people that are unhappy. What are some of the more memorable characters and memorable events that you've hosted in the past couple of years? Well, years? We, we hosted Hugo Chavez. Uh, people don't remember uh, when he first came into office. Um, uh, he was not as belligerent as he became later on. Um, he came to Washington. He spoke at a dialogue event. We think tank that sponsored him. Uh, that was extremely interesting. 
Um, I think that a lot of these kind of figures have, you know, arouse a lot of curiosity and interest in Washington. So we, you know, we have them uh, come, and uh, we've had a, a number of other uh, heads of state that I think were also also very very interesting. We also have had a lot of events on uh, Colombia. We had one particular event with uh, President Uribe um, that took place in always Congress. Uh, and always talking to the crowd, and always so some sparks. Um, which was fascinating uh, with members of Congress and some of the exchanges uh, that took place there. That, that's a, that was an unforgettable event within, within Congress. And then some Colombian uh, panels, um, which had representatives of really the, the far right uh, and of the far left and people, you know, different points in the spectrum, political spectrum. Uh, and you really saw, uh, and these were actors, these were not analysts, these were people who were actually, you know, political actors. And, but, but very, very intense, as sometimes Colombian events c can get, um, but absolutely fascinating and, um, you know, and respectful in a way, for, strong, uh, tough, but respectful. And I remember those, and I remember the reactions of some of the people at our events, and just just it just was very a, very impressed. An event with the Bolivian opposition yes, that got, that Bolivian. triggered some security as yes, well. Yes, there were that things got a little bit out of hand, unfortunately. Uh, somebody who uh, who who did who came from nowhere and um, looked at some point that he could be president of Bolivia. Uh, it didn't turn out to be, but uh, Mr. Camacho, and um, and that really generated a lot of. Opposition, but I, my feeling was that you know this is a very relevant. We try to get people who are relevant uh, to their you know who could be who could be president of their country, who could be leader of their country, and there were a lot of what struck me about that are events, despite the fact that it was very polarized and you had some actual fighting, uh, physical fighting, um, and things got out of control. You also had a lot of Bolivians who live in the Washington area who came, younger Bolivians, and they said, and they expressed that they said, you know, we want to know what this guy is. You know, uh, he might win. Uh, you know, he, got, he had strong support, and uh, he might be the next president of Bolivia, and we have no idea who he is and what he's like and what he thinks, and they said, that's why we came. And I think that was what you know, I, th I felt that that was something that the useful that the dialogue uh, could do, although we got a lot of flack for that. We also had a vice minister of uh, foreign relations of Nicaragua, of Daniel Ortega's Nicaragua, um, that got some opposition to having somebody like that. But I had, before accepting to do that, I had consulted with a lot of uh, good friends with the Nicaraguan opposition. And I said, you know, what do you think? Um, what do you think? Should we, should we do this? And what their comment was very interesting. They said, you know, we don't know if there's a negotiated solution to this crisis in Nicaragua, but if there is, this person who wants to come would be a player, will be part of that negotiation. So yes, um, you should en engage him and see what, what you can do. Um, not everybody thought that way. A lot of Washington-based people didn't think that way. But these were good friends and who were very strong anti-Ortega folks who advised me to say, you know, who knows? There could be a negotiation and this person would be an important player. So, yes, I think you should do it. So one of the things that the, the dialogue has done is grant leadership awards every year to people around the region who have really exercised change. With all of these lessons in leadership and with your years in the region, and this is the America's Table is a leadership series, do you have kind of lessons to share with our viewers? Well, I think, you know, leadership is, um, uh, when I first started teaching uh, a course in Georgetown called Political Leadership in Latin America, um, I got some reactions from some political scientists saying, you know, leaders are not really important. What are important is institutions. And individuals are not really, you know, it's what matters are structures and institutions. And people are, are not really, you know, really uh, rele very relevant or very important in shaping the situation. I think a lot of those people would change their view today. Um, this was like 15, 20 years ago. So leadership is now, fortunately, uh, taken a lot more seriously. Uh, as than it used to be, 
Uh, because I think people have seen evidence that, you know, if you have somebody versus somebody else, it, it makes a difference for the direction of a country. So I think leadership is, I think that debate is won. Uh, but there was a lot of people that challenged me and said, you know, this is not a, you know, serious course because it's all structures and institutions. But, you know, leadership, leaders, you know, shape institutions and shape structures and, you know, structures, you know, condition leaders. I mean, it's, it's a, it works both ways. Um, but I certainly think there are, you know, I remember Albert Hirschman, who was somebody that, uh, an economist who was a very political economist who I always admired, who wrote about leadership, political leadership. And he said there are three elements, and I remember this. One is, you know, charisma or ability to connect with people, which I think is important. I think a lot of the leaders that the dialogue has honored over the years, are they connect with people, either business leaders or political leaders or, or leaders in different, different fields. The second is they certainly have certain skills. Uh, they have skills of leadership in mobilizing people and in managing people and so forth. And the final ingredient is 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 luck, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and you and many of the leaders that are very very prominent in Latin America, if you ask them, uh, you know, how they became leaders, you know, some of them will say, I, you know, I had some luck. I would happen to be there at the right time under these conditions, and it worked. Things worked out for me. And if I didn't know that person or the other person. Maybe I wouldn't end up being in this leadership position that I'm in today. So I think that's a very honest self-appraisal. One should never underestimate uh, the importance of luck. But also, I think, uh, ability to connect, and I think also skills, uh, obviously a vision of where you want to go, that you're not just kind of managing uh, things, but you're really sort of looking forward always. Um, and I think also trying to get... Uh, people who work work with you who are better than you, not to be threatened by by other people. Um, and I always try to get people, in, in, at least in my current job of the dialogue, getting people who are smarter than I am, that are better than I am, which has not, not been too hard. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think that's a sign of a, of a good leader as well. And I think our, our most successful presidents of the United States are those that got very strong people as advisors and cabinet members. So I think that's another important thing. And I think it applies to business, politics, uh, civil society, whatever sector you happen to be in. Michael Shifter, welcome back to Georgetown, and it's thank you for joining me at the America's Table. It's been a pleasure thank having you. you with us. Thank you, Mooney. It's been terrific. Thank you for the invitation. Mm -hmm.